Hello, everyone. This is a historical moment. This is the first Tying That Guy Expanse After Show. I'm Wes Chatham. And I'm Ty Frank. Today, we're going to be discussing episode 501, Exodus, with a special guest, Narain Shankar, the showrunner of the show. I just want to say ahead of time, I apologize for Ty's mood. If there's one person to not butt dial, it's Ty Frank at 5 a.m. And somehow I <laughs> ended up doing that. And then he finally drifted off to sleep. And then I sent him a text saying, I was sorry to wake him up. <laughs> wake him up again. <laughs> and the guy sleeps, you know, maybe two and a half hours a night. So uh, uh, yeah, I apologize about that. But um, all right, we're getting into 501. I'm excited about this. Yeah, uh, this was a... Uh... This is a big deal. Uh, the The book that this uh, that this season is based on, uh, season five, is probably one of the favorite books in our series, or one of the fan favorite books in our series. Episode one is where we split up the crew, which is new for the show too. I mean, usually, you guys, the four of you, have been working together nonstop for I don't know four years now, and this is the first time you were all working separately. It was really interesting because it did not feel like the expanse at first. Our first shot, we were actually shooting in downtown Toronto uh, as as a as doubling for Baltimore, and it was unlike uh, anything that we've done because I always have the crew with me in that familiar surrounding, and uh, there was something really interesting about that. But on a personal note, uh, book five happens to be my favorite book, and I was so excited about jumping in to uh, d- to getting into this book and getting into this season. But one thing that, I'm, that I want to ask you about that I'm fascinated in is when I think about you looking at the books, when I think about you and Daniel looking at the vast ocean of story that you're going to cover as you're doing a book, and this is kind of runs parallel with the opening, is, this, is the setups. Like, how do you look at uh, season five? Do you start with a point of view, a theme? Like, how do you create and shape the trajectories and the spines of the characters going in for a whole season? What, what are the questions you ask yourself going into season five? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's different depending on the book or the season. Uh, with book five, we always knew, once we knew we were doing a nine book series, we always knew book five was sort of the, the axle of the wheel. It's, it's the center point around which everything else was gonna revolve. Um, and so we'd been building to that for four books that that we knew when we got to that point, it was going to be the first time that our point of view characters were going to be the four members of the Rossi crew. And it was going to be the first time we split all four of them up and sent them on their own way. So we spent four books laying in sort of the, the hinting at the backstory that was going to be revealed in book five. So you get hints about Amos's backstory and, and his time in Baltimore as a kid. And you get hints about what happens to Naomi uh, when she was with the OPA. And, and, you know, and hints about Alex's uh, home life and why he wound up, you know, on the Canterbury. And then you hit book five and then you get to fully explore all those things that you've been hinting at for four books. So it was, it, it, we always knew it was the target. Um, and when we got there, uh, we had so much stuff that we laid in that we could explore that it, it was almost, uh, it was almost like the book wasn't long enough. You know, we could have spent even more time in there. And, and you come out the other side of book five and the rest of the series is, is the trajectory that that book is going to launch. So it was, you know, we, it was, as I said, it was like the hub of the wheel, you know, we get there, we build everything. And then the rest of the series is just playing out all the stories that have been built inside. What I think is fascinating about this from an actor's perspective and playing the character of Amos is we've all been together for six years now. And I've been in deep meditative thought for six years uh, about um, Amos and his journey. And also I've had the benefit of the books to really dive into his past, but I don't think I would have been able to uh, do season five the way that we ended up executing it without that six years of background and really getting into uh, his circumstances, what he wants. It's such a there's such, it's such a complex character and, and there's so many multifaceted uh, things that are motivating him and really getting under the hood and understanding that. And so being the timing of just my journey as an actor playing Amos and doing season five at the point that we did do it, I needed those six years to really uh, get in the mindset to have Amos living within me to be able to do that in an honest way. And so, um, I, I've never 
uh, been involved in a story or a character for this long amount of time. Um, and there's something that I think as us, as a family, as the Expanse family and uh, you guys, the writers and the, the relationships that we all have uh, in the hard work that we've done in the beginning, it is really starting to, uh, you know, we're really starting to play jazz now, you know, in a kind of connection and relationship with people as we're going forward. And so I think that season five is so special to me because we had to work so hard to get there and to be able to be as honest and uh, in, in, in the, the storytelling that we're in as we're deep diving in these characters. And we've all done this work to get to this point. Yeah. And, and it's uh, it, there's no guarantee you're going to get a season five. There's no guarantee you're going to get a season two. So the fact that we've been lucky enough to keep doing this to the, you know, to the point where we were able to make season five is amazing to me. Yeah. And I know, uh, you know, we're, as we, as we do these uh, episodes about season five, you know, we're going to get a chance to talk to a lot of the other actors, but I, I, I find that process of finding the character, you know, you said you had to, you had to do this for six years to find the version of Amos you could play in season five. I find that really interesting. You know, the, the, the work that each actor does to find their way into the character. And uh, we've been lucky. We've got a lot of really thoughtful actors, you know, Stevens, uh, you know, he's, he's a philosopher and, and Naomi's, uh, or Naomi, Dom, Dom is, is a very thoughtful actor. And I know you've done a lot of research too um, mm -hmm. on, on the, uh, the trauma, what the trauma of a childhood like Amos had does uh -huh. to you and how that turns you into the person that you're playing on the show. Well, I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I try to do is, is you take uh, similarities. And, and I think, you know, going into 501 and as we begin to talk to this, the, the seeds that you planted in the backstory and being able to have the benefit of the churn when I've really started and, and sitting down with um, a therapist and people and, and reading the churn and, and really getting a detailed understanding of what that would look like. Uh, and that's a child that went through that and what that would look like as an adult and what the, what's going on through him. This was the first season that from an academic perspective, I didn't really have to go through my notes the same way. This is the first season where I would be reading the scripts and it was so alive in me that I would be moved to tears by the circumstances within the script. And so, you know, and that only comes with that kind of immersion uh, into a character for six years, um, you know, to, <laughs> to the point you sow your, your personal circumstances and your personal life within the character circumstances. So what he wants, what he's trying to achieve, even on a subconscious level, what he's motivated by, it becomes so a part of who you are that who you are kind of starts to blur with, with Amos. And there's something that is so authentic and honest in the experiences that you have that, you know, from this point forward, I'm always going to be trying creatively to achieve this level of connection to a character. Um, and I, you know, this whole thing, I've, I've learned so much, you know, going through, um, being able to be a part of something for six years. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a good way to segue into the episode itself. So you talked about the churn there. Uh, one of the, one of the shorter stories we've written in the expanse, but um, talks a lot about Amos's backstory. So this is the episode where Amos goes home um, where he's, you know, uh, he's lost somebody that he cares about back in Baltimore. Um, he worries that maybe uh, you know, that wasn't natural causes. And uh, he feels an obligation if, if it wasn't to go do something about that. And so we send him home. Uh, but that's, that's true of almost all of our characters in this season. Uh, you know, uh, Dom, you know, Na Naomi is going back to her past, going back to the, the family she left behind when she fled uh, the OPA. Alex is going home to Mars to try to you know, if, if not patch up what happened with his family, then at least, you know, find some closure for it. And, uh, and Steven is, uh, you know, he just gets left. Everybody just ditches him. is <laughs> 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 leave him on, on Tycho, uh, to try to figure out. And once again, you know, Steven is, uh, Holden is always the Cassandra of the show. He's the one going, Hey guys, maybe we should worry about the aliens. <laughs> and, you know, everybody's like, no, we got, we got personal shit to do, but, uh, right. You know, it just ditch him there. But uh, it's uh, it, it creates a, an interesting, you know, in the same way that it created that dynamic in the book, it creates an interesting dynamic in the show where, you know, you were talking about you didn't have the comfort of Stephen and Dom and Kaz with you all the time. You know, you get used to that and it, it just becomes sort of a, a comfortable place to be. And now suddenly you're thrown into 
a completely different sort of scenario. And eventually we do, you know, link you back up with some, some people you've worked with before, but especially in this first episode, um, you know, when you're on the, when you're on the ship flying to, flying to Luna, um, this is all new stuff, all new, all new characters you're interacting with a whole new set of circumstances. You do get a, a nice moment with, uh, with the Vasarala on, on Luna. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's all brand new stuff for, uh, for Amos. Um, and you know, the other, the other characters are in the same situation mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, we're throwing them into entirely new, entirely new circumstances, very uncomfortable, unsettling circumstances. Yeah. I'm looking at my notes, you know, I watched, I rewatched the episode last night. Um, actually it's the first time I watched it like fully done with the, the, the fully visual effects and, I mean, and when we, uh, our special guest, when we bring our special guest on, I really want to get in depth uh, in that. But one of the things that I wrote out was isolation alone and the family is separated. Uh, and one of the things I love most about, you know, uh, reoccurring books or series or shows or is when you start something new, uh, I like the introduction of the characters, the people that you've grown to love. And then it's kind of like, you know, we haven't seen these guys in a year, uh, you know, and then, and then what have they been up to? What's happening? Where? And, and kind of really finding the setup and the, the spine and the, the, what's going to, what, what is the arc or what is the future going to look like for them in this season? And I really thought uh, 501, I really loved uh, how visually the story was told uh, by Bobby on a, on a vast planet who's alone and, and Amos in a, in a in a circle, in a, on a ship where a bunch surrounded by strangers, um, and, uh, Kaz going back to Mars, uh, you know, uh, Steven being abandoned <laughs> by his family and going through the roll call of all his old crew, whatever. Um, I find, uh, I find that those setups and everything is interesting. And I think this would be a good time to bring in, uh, our special guests to, uh, you know, start to kind of really talk about these things going forward. Yeah, uh, so Narain Shankar is uh, executive producer and showrunner on The Expanse. Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion about what a showrunner is in the fans. So I, one of the first things I want to do is ask Narain to explain to the fans what a showrunner does. Hey, guys. I guess that's my cue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what does a showrunner do? Well, you know, it's a... I agree. It's, a, it's kind of a misunderstood term because it is a um, it, it's a weird job. It has lots of different aspects and lots of different disciplines. It is a um, you know, you are essentially the, the head writer on the show. You set the creative tone of the show. You manage the writing staff. You're responsible to the budget. You are intimately involved with production. You talk to the directors. You work with the actors. You work through post. You do the cuts, you go to the sound mixes, you, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a large thing. Um, um, it, I think it rewards maybe people who are kind of right brain and left brain a little bit because it, it does have a lot of weirdly overlapping um, uh, responsibilities are often also contradictory in terms of, you know, there's writers who who just love writing and don't want to be disturbed and they don't want to deal with management and they don't want to deal with spreadsheets or budgets. And um, so it's a, it's got kind of a broad, it's got kind of a broad portfolio. Yeah. I, from, from my perspective, uh, what the showrunner is, is the final vote on every decision. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and that doesn't mean, uh, you know, having worked with you now for coming up on six years, uh, that doesn't mean that you, uh, micromanage everything, but anytime something needs a final vote, a, a final decision must be made. Yours is the last voice that gets to cast a vote. Um, and, and so it means that at, at least from my perspective, the showrunner has some influence on literally everything in the show. Costume. That's, yeah, that's yeah. absolutely, that's absolutely yeah. true. And, you know, I think, I think the, the interesting thing about, about, you know, film and television as a, as an organization is every department is incredibly specialized and incredibly, you know, uh, competent and adept and, and, and they know everything about their specialty, but there are very few people who are responsible for the entirety of the product. 
And so what that what that actually does is I am using the term product loosely because it is ultimately it's an artistic endeavor. Did you refer to uh, the expanse as piece of art every time? <laughs> uh, you know what? Masterpiece it, works. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, there, there's, a, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I'm digressing here, but it's like, there's a famously, there's a producer way back in, in the Hollywood days, uh, I mean, uh, uh, like uh, 80s television days, who had a sign on, on behind his, his, uh, his desk in his office was, it's not show art. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so you know, in terms of one of the things that I love about this and love that we're getting a chance to do this is what, what uh, Ty and I were talking about earlier is that we, you know, rarely in, in careers do you get to create something uh, as um, exciting as The Expanse with the same group of people and work on the same characters for six years. So we've gotten to know each other so well. You know, we're like family. I mean, Ty probably doesn't think of us as family, but we think of him as family. But um, so, you know, one of the things that I love about doing this after show and getting to hang out and talk with each other is to really get the fans uh, to, to see, you know, how passionate we are about the show. But also um, there's a lot of people like you, Narain, that's involved with the show that they probably don't know personally in a well, as well as we do. And, and there's, if, if I literally wanted to create a show runner in a test tube of like, that would be as perfect for these fans, you would be the one. And so, um, you know, I, I, to tell a little personal story to kind of give you an idea of what uh, kind of encapsulates what Narain is a showrunner. <laughs> so uh, it was a particularly hard season and Narain was, his back was against the wall. He was pulling all nighters or, you know, and I, I wasn't really aware of this. Um, I was just being self-involved and, and involved with my character. So, uh, and I would be in the coffee shop early in the morning and every morning, poor Narain would be busting in through the doors trying to get his cup of coffee so we can get back up and keep the the trains running on time and he dark his hair it, looked, it reminded me of Kramer when he busts in his bed head was sticking up circles on the guys come busting in and I was always like and I'm a good in a good mood in the morning I'm a morning guy and I'm like hey no rain and I'm like oh what a coincidence and I'd have my script and my notes and I'm like hey you know can we have you know a few questions I would ask him some you know random like and I'd see him take a deep breath He'd get his coffee and he would sit down and waste his time with me until I had every question answered, everything was filled. And, and then he went up and I never knew the load that was on his shoulders or what he was accomplished till later. And then I heard about later, you know, the, how difficult things were. And then I remember thinking, Jesus Christ, like I was like, you know, <laughs> bugging him in the morning, but that's the kind of showrunner you are and how gracious you are with your time and, and the kind of attention you pay to everyone. And he's nice to the actors. He's not nearly that nice to the, <laughs> the writers. By the way, <laughs> From from my perspective, what that was is I I'd be up to three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. It was a, it was a real rough stretch of like constant back to back rewrites and and just a lot of stuff was going on at the same time. I come down into the coffee shop. I was like you know, basically in my sweats. I just rolled out of bed. It's like I barely even had like you know sometimes you know probably no socks on. I'm just kind of trudging down. And there's Wes in the corner, same corner every fucking time. It's like he just gotten out of working out. He's having his breakfast. He's all this like showered up. He's looking good. And like, it's like, and I'm like, oh God, please don't see me. And then he would see me. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was like, oh, fuck. Oh. <laughs> I do have one really concrete example of um, the technical work that the showrunner does I wanted to talk about because it's specific to, to episode one. Um, and and give me a moment to take you through this. Um, so in episode one, in the script of episode one, um, we describe a fight that Amos has on the ship with some uh, with some people who are trying to extort money on the ship, and we describe it uh, you know as as a as a, you know an elaborate fight sequence in the showers, and then our our stunt coordinator Matt Berman uh, put together a, a, a complicated fight that Wes then practiced. Uh, with the stunt crew uh, that we, sh you know, took a bunch of time to shoot. And then um, I remember sitting with uh, Noreen in the editing room afterwards. Um, and we were talking about what parts of it were working, what parts weren't. And then I, I see a new cut. Uh, it was, it was a couple days later. I see new cut of that episode. This is very early cuts, but I see a new cut of that episode and he has cut that fight scene down to the one that's actually in the episode now, where it is just, it's, you know, it begins with, we see Amos going into the shower, he's covered in blood. And then we just keep cutting to one or two second 
moments of the most violent moments of that fight. And we lost all of that choreography. We lost all that stuff, but you know what? It is so much more powerful in that, in that way, the way that it's cut now. And to me, that's the epitome of what a showrunner does. A showrunner looks at the stuff that you've got and makes those sorts of decisions where he's, he's like, you know, yeah, we wrote it this way. Yeah, it was practiced that way. Yeah, the actor did it that way. It's not working. What can I cut out of this to make it a thing that works? And over and over again, watching Noreen work, and I assume other showrunners are the same way, is, is it's, it's digging through what you've got because you always wind up with a lot more stuff than you need. And it's digging through to find, you know, it's digging through scripts to find those nuggets in a script and helping the writer you know, do better. And it's digging through performances and it's digging through film that we've shot um, and, and sort of taking all of those little golden pieces and building something really special out of it. That fight scene was a brutal scene to shoot. And uh, we shot it all day and we, and uh, we went through it. And when I heard that it, uh, Oh, uh, and somebody said in passing, Oh, it was completely different. Now it was edited down and, and they said it and went, I was like, what? <laughs> like you know that was so, so last night i was watching it really i think for the first time i don't think it was uh fully put together when we saw it the first, but i watched it last night with my wife and it really hit me and it's like oh you know he really uh re he it's not that that fight scene wasn't necessarily what it where what it was about it was about amos's state and his expression of that state and yeah. the way that it was edited was so perfect and so powerful and my wife paused it and she said this is the way that this is edited is unbelievable. And, and I said, it, it was Narain, Narain's choice. She called Narain literally <laughs> that last night and was like, Jesus Christ, this is unbelievable. And it's such an interesting creative choice. And, uh, and you know, again, to, to your point, Ty, like that's, that's a great showrunner to have that instinct to see what the scene is about and how to express it technically through that. Well, that was, you know, what that really was more than anything was a story problem because in 501, the, the whole thing that's going on with Amos, the way the story is structured is, is what is going on with him? Why is he on edge? Why is he more violent? What is he angry about? And in the novel, you have full access to Amos's interior monologue. It starts with, you know, Lydia dies. You know, it's like, it's like, it's literally like the first sentence of that chapter, I think it is, you know, Lydia Maloof was, Lydia was dead. Um, and so you never, you know, without access to that, well, how do you express what's going on in this character with film? And so when we got to that fight sequence, which which Breck Eisner, the director, did a beautiful job filming and, and Wes was, I mean, it was, it was big and tough and mean and everything else. But when we watched it in the cut, what it wasn't doing was conveying really what the essence of the story needed, which was what's going on with this character? Why is he angry? What's happening with him? It just felt like a fight. And so, so to me, it was, it, it was by, by being objective with the camera in that sequence, it actually undercut what the story was trying to do. And so I, I, I asked the editor, I said, listen, here's an idea um, how to make this a little bit more subjective. It was really just starting with Amos in the shower with the blood and then flashing and, and the editor, Stephen Roke, did a, an amazing job when he put that together. He went to cut to black with it. And, 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 and I was like, literally, like I saw it for the first time, I said, that's amazing. And so he gets top marks for that. And, and it was, and it seems to have had the effects, like everybody who sees the cut, even, even Breck, when he saw it, when, when I, I gave him my cut, it was like, he's like, wait, what happened? Like for a second, when it goes to black, and then he saw it and he's like, that was that was exactly what it needed. So that was a, that was that's part of the fun of the job, honestly. It's like finding that those different ways, you know, to work with all those different elements, and then ultimately you get a get the effect like that. It's good to me. That that moment is the thing that boils down the essence of what a showrunner does is is exactly that sort of decision because I mean, that's a decision that that only you can make. Right. And, you know, as, as a writer on the show, I can't just run up and tell the editor to start cutting up somebody else's episode. <laughs> right. But, but you can. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and we, we've done that so many times. I think you've seen over the years, Ty, is like, you know, you, you I mean, I, I can remember those moments from season one. The one, the story you tell was like when Daniel said, well, that was a good run. <laughs> it was so yeah. bad. <laughs>
so we were sort of mostly in season one, we were just kind of hanging around learning the business. And, you know, I followed Narain around everywhere. He would let me follow. I think I followed him more than he wanted me to. He was like, yeah, can you leave me alone now? <laughs> I was trying to watch everything happen. So, so Daniel and I went in, uh, I'm not going to say which episode it is or, uh, you know, throw anybody under the bus, but there was an episode in season one that we watched the first cut of. And, and Daniel walked out and he turned into rain and he goes, well, it was fun while it lasted. Like he literally thought this episode has ended the show. The show, like everybody's going to see this episode. Um, there, you know, sci-fi will immediately cancel us without having aired anything. <laughs> this is it. And it, Narain, was, it was bad. <laughs> it was and bad. Went, we were in the middle of shooting, you know, they, in, I saw somebody outside that's connected related and was smoking a cigarette, staring at the, staring at the moon and I showed up and, and I was like, Hey, how did the screening go? And he just looked at me as smoke's coming out of his mouth and he just goes, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, all right, I guess I go back to work. <laughs> but but Narain went in and he cut that episode up and built a Frankenstein monster out of it, out of using parts from other things. And you know what? You'll never know which episode it was. You'll never know because it like it, for a lot of people, it's one of their favorite episodes of, of season one. It was hilarious. I, I remember going in with the editor after we had screened the director's cut. And and I just, I, I always watch it several times before I even start editing. But uh, I, 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 we ran it again and this, it ended. And Susan Susan Shipton was the director, uh, was the uh, editor. And um, and she it was like dead silence in the room. And I just started laughing. I was like, I was like, this is terrible. <laughs> just terrible and, I, and then i said but i think i know how to fix it so <laughs> and i said i i'm betting that people are gonna like to see it it was it was philosophically just not in the right place and it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't what it needed to be thematically or or without well we're not going to get it too much into detail what it was but yeah. yes it was um that was a <laughs> that was a big salvage job <laughs> to turn it back on to 501 you know yeah because I was asking Ty from a, uh, a writer's perspective, but I'd be uh, the setup of the story. So I, I would be interested from a showrunner's perspective and you're looking in season five and you uh, know the spine of the characters and what you're kind of going to create in the projection that you're going to go with. How do you set it up visually? Like, how do you, what are the questions you ask yourself of like, where are they going to be and how are we doing the setup? Well, what we've typically done over the last, especially over the last few years, is at the end of any season, Ty and Daniel and I will we'll sit down and we'll talk sort of about like, you know, what is kind of the plan for the next season? So we get an idea in our heads about what it is. Book five is, as I think, it's my favorite book of, of the this, this series. Um, and it, it has a structure that really lends itself to the show, you know, I think really, really well. The biggest decision, honestly, I think at the beginning was, uh, in the sense of starting everybody out, because Ty, check me on this. In the novel, everybody is on Tycho for a good chunk of time. I mean, it's the it's, it's sort of like you, you, the classic way you guys reset, right? And they sort of peel off one it's, by it's one. Not, it's not very long. It's maybe a couple of chapters, but they are all together. On right, Tycho. they're all together, right. Um, so, and and for for me, I, I think the thing that, that I felt strongly about was especially after four years with these characters, it, it would be really interesting to just have everybody on their own path because, you know, the audience is given this, you know, privileged point of view at the end of season four that Marco has launched the rocks and the rocks are coming. So that, that idea is looming over the story. I mean, we talked about, you know, looming, we talked about the looming tower. It's like, you know, you know, what's happening and you know what's coming to the World Trade Center, right? So that informs the drama. So what happens with the story in 501 is by putting everybody out on an independent path, you understand as an audience member, emotionally, maybe even subconsciously, that all of these people are, are going to be separated as a cataclysmic event occurs in some fashion. And so the idea of putting everybody on their path, it's clean you know, structurally because then the path of the season, you know, the question you're essentially posing quite rapidly is, you know, how are our people going to get back together? How are those threads going to wind together? Um, and so the decision in 501 was simply, you know, Alex is off on his own. Amos is off on his own. Avastral is on Luna. You know, 
um, the parting between Holden and Naomi is really just kind of the centerpiece because we start with these guys, you know, the two of them, you've never seen them sort of more committed, more, more together. Everything seems to be, okay, we've gotten our shit together. There's commerce in the ring, as well, Ty said. Naomi, Holden, Holden, especially, yeah. Naomi right. Holden especially seemed very domestic. Yes, yes. And that was... Yeah. yeah, that those like those elements are from the book. It's like they're talking about like you know getting dinner together. It's like they're living in a nice kind of room on Tycho in this nice place, and it's like, and of course Holden is Cassandra. He just can't, you know, he can't, you know, get that thing out of his head. And and the idea of building the story so that the last element is Holden alone. That was really what I think it, it gives it some emotional weight. Is that the one parting that you see? is this really rough moment between Holden and Naomi where she just says, I don't want you to come with me to do this really important thing. Like the, the guy who loves her the most, the guy who'd be the most incredibly supportive, she can't bring him into that. And then you you break the entire family up and there's Holden alone on the Rossi and the cup's just tumbling in zero G. I mean, it's like, it's kind of, it's just, it had some beauty to it. And um, and that that sort of image of what it was, I think for me, it was very early. You know, and and um, it set the whole season on its path. I, I love him going through the images of all his buddies. I think that's coming. I think that's coming up. It's, it's uh, five foot two. It's like no messages, no yeah. messages, no messages, <laughs> no messages, no messages, no messages. Nobody loves me. Well, listen, brother. I'm so glad to have you on, and uh, I think you know one of the 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 things that uh we really wanted to achieve is that we've gotten to know each other so well um with you and and uh with the expanse family and we we have and uh you know ty and i were talking about this in quarantine is like we have these great conversations and such interesting people uh and we would love to be able to get in depth and really look under the hood of the specific episodes for the fans and have them come and learn stuff about the show that they couldn't get anywhere else but also to get to know the people involved with it and and kind of be involved in our conversations because these are the conversations we have as we're doing the work that we do this is how we creatively shape in in uh and in, in in the kind of you know the passion and the love that we put into it to create uh the expanse and so uh this has just been such a uh this is going to be a, a great opportunity for us to do that to sit down with the people involved in the expanse and get in depth in the show and um and thank you for coming on and hanging out with us yeah, thanks. Um, my pleasure, guys. This is really fun. I hope the you know I think the fans are going to get a real nice look at the inside of this show, and it is a unique organization. I mean, I think it's rare when you have the same group of writers with this kind of connection with the actors um, and the departments for this length of time, especially in this era. So um, I'm going to be watching. Thanks for having me on. And uh, if you're interested more about the podcast, check out tyingthatguy.com for more info. Um, and then also thank you everyone for coming to hang out with us. And if you like it, subscribe, I guess they're going to do it down here. Subscribe, like, and let us know what you think. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, we'll, we'll get together soon. We're coming back shortly with 502, uh, with the great Steven Strait and the mediocre, uh, Breck Eisner. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we hope you join us and hang out with us. Yeah. See you then. Look at this, this is what it's like working on a studio.